morning, everyone. Just getting everything situated here. Okay, so my name is Nicole, and I'm the parent support worker for the Niagara Catholic District School Board Early On Child and Family Center. I am here today for our weekly coffee and conversation in which all parents, grandparents, guardians, and caregivers are welcome. Our program topics revolve around ensuring that you feel well, confident, and present in your parenting and caregiving role. As always, if you are unable to sit with me now, you are welcome to warm up your coffee or your tea and sit with me at a later, more convenient time. We now post all of our video content to our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe and stay up to date with our videos. Today, we are going to be talking about emotional literacy. So to discuss this with you today, I will be providing you with some research and some great books that you can use to help support your minis or your child's emotional literacy. But I'd like to start with this adult book. It's called The, um, it's called the Emotionary. It's a dictionary of words that don't exist for feelings that do. And this book is by Eden Scher and Julia Wirtz. So here are some funny, interesting ones for the very emotions we might be feeling during quarantine. So the first one we have here is, I'll just show you the page real quick. It's desolation. So this is the combination of the words desperation and isolation being defined as the paralysis of wanting to reach out to other people, but being too comfortable in isolation. So you can see there's this little comic here of a girl on a uh, on her bed and it says, Oh no, Abby's cat died? Aw, oh, she loved that cat. I should go visit her. Or maybe I could just call her to express my condolences without having to put on pants. Or I could just send her an email so I don't have to speak words with my mouth. Or I could just do nothing because any kind of communication always spirals into something that forces me to engage socially with another human being and that's just really not my journey right now. So that's a pretty good one. We also have lone sanity, which is the combination of the words loneliness and insanity being defined as a delirium caused by sustained periods of no human company. So that's another one quite relevant. And our last one here, uh, it's something that I'm sure that we could, we wish we could all be right now. It's called Belignorant, which is possessing a jolly naivete about life and the world. However, if you're here listening to me today, I'm sure you are looking to be anything other than belignorant. belignorant. So let's discuss emotional literacy. Starting with your own emotional literacy and or your understanding of your child's emotional development. So what is emotional literacy? In Emotional Literacy in the Early Years, it's a book written by Christine Bruce, she references that the original definition of emotional literacy pointed to social intelligence. So social intelligence was simply a person's ability to understand the difference between emotion and action. So the literacy piece that you hear often typically comes from our foundation in education and early learning for, ch for children, which essentially just means that we recognize and support a child's emotional awareness. So Bruce referred to research that suggests the key to emotional literacy is to not only recognize emotions in the self and in others, but to also have an understanding and control of these emotions. So I understand that I can get super angry when I go too long without eating. But I can control that anger when I know that food won't be guaranteed for a substantial part of my day. Likewise, you might recognize that your mini or your child gets upset when you or your co-parent leave for work. But are you able to assist your child in understanding that emotion of feeling frustrated and upset and then control or model their behavior um, in a way that's, that's appropriate um, in result of that feeling? So in later chapters, Bruce then went on to discuss the role of adults in ensuring emotional literacy in our little ones. So she stated, and I quote, As adults, we have a responsibility to our children who emulate our words and actions 
and so we need to consider the implications of what we say and what we do. This reinforces the concepts I've given in the past that we must model appropriate behavior and we must model our own emotional literacy. But even our capacity to do this isn't always enough. So Bruce reminds us that a child needs to feel safe and secure in their environment before feeling confident enough to take the challenge or risk that is necessary to learn. And this can include their emotional literacy too. So therefore, we need to support our kids' resiliency. And resilience allows our kids to understand that they can overcome their failings, their mistakes, or their tribulations. So in other terms, it's the ability to bounce back from adversity. And this can be ensured by recognizing and praising successful and not so successful attempts at learning. So an example of this in relation to emotional literacy is this. Say your child is trying to disconnect two pieces of Lego but cannot. So they start to look overwhelmed, frustrated, and angry. Perhaps they throw the Lego across the room. An immediate response from you would be to reprimand the child for that inappropriate behavior. And sometimes if the child hurts themselves or someone else, then that will be needed. But in the comfort of your quiet home, you can take that chance to recognize that your child is feeling a very intense emotion. And perhaps you can maybe praise them for having that emotion and say things like, wow, what could it be that you're feeling right now? Are you happy? No. Are you sad? Maybe. How about angry? And then after they've calmed down and you can then educate them on proper behavior when they're feeling angry, um, that, that, that'll that help them out. But we'll talk about those strategies for regulating those behaviors in coming weeks. Um, back to emotional literacy, parents influence their child's emotional literacy by creating an environment that is positive and encouraging. In another example, I've worked with many little ones, and I'll tell you, they fall a lot. And it's very easy to say a quick, upsy daisy, you're okay, let's go, keep playing, in an attempt to save myself from dealing with a meltdown that may be primarily induced by fear. But what might be missing in that piece is what Bruce calls an emotionally literate response that would instead empathize, empathize with, the with what the child might be feeling. So even if that is more fear than pain when a child falls, much like you would have done in the example earlier when the child feels angry and frustrated about the Lego piece, when appropriate, it's good for us to put our behavioral expectations aside for a moment to work on that emotional literacy piece as well. But don't forget, your child doesn't have to be able to share these emotions with you verbally to start these conversations. According to Helen Cowie in her book, From Birth to 16, parents can start distinguishing a range of emotions in their baby within the very first months of life. They might notice when their baby is happy or content, interested, sad, fearful, or even in pain. I don't know this as well as you would, but I have been in situations where I've held a relative's baby, and when that baby starts to become unsettled, the parent is always quick to rescue by telling me exactly what they think the baby needed. So they might say like, oh, Nicole, she's getting hungry, let me take her. Or Nicole, try patting her back, and then seconds later after this has been complete, the baby is content. So parents are, in my opinion, they are mind readers. I don't get it yet. I'm not a parent. I don't know how it works, but you parents really do amaze me. But what this means to me is that parents and caregivers are respecting that their infants and young children are capable of nonverbal communication. In relation to this perspective, Cowie referenced what's called mind-mindedness, which is essentially refers to a parent's perspective and approach to their infant as having a mind rather than just being this cute little creature that just needs to be fed and needs to be loved. She mentioned that the parent's ability to have mind-mindedness is crucial in the early years of a child's life. And as I've emphasized in week 
in weeks prior, Cowie referenced the study which actually demonstrated that when parents talked to their baby about what was going on in their mind, it predicted the child's capacity to later understand other people's emotions. So if you're feeling a little cuckoo for talking out loud to your infant, don't. This is actually super great for their development. So going back to work done by Bruce, in one of her studies, she found that children showed a limited ability to express both their own emotional understanding and that of, her, of their peers. And she suggested that within her study population, this could have resulted from children simply not having the language to understand or express what they were feeling. And when this happens, we might see signs of aggression or withdrawal because the child's unsure how to appropriately react in that scenario or to appropriately communicate what they're feeling. So the research clearly tells us that we need to be starting the conversation of emotional literacy with our children from a very early age. Little tea break. So now that you believe me when I say talk with your children about emotions, we are going to look at some resources that you can grab to help assist you in this journey. So I'll start off with three really great books that are just about emotions and feelings. So this will help you just to start that conversation with your child or your mini. And I'll link each of these in the comments after we're done. So we have um, Making Faces, which is published by Abrams Appleseed. As the title says, this is a first book of emotions. It's a great way to get your little one to start thinking about emotions. This book shows multiple baby faces to help your little one start recognizing what it looks like to be angry. And there's even a mirror at the back of the book um, that will help your little one practice what it looks like to be happy, sad, angry, surprised, and silly. So this is a really great book. We also have the Feelings book by Todd Parr. So this book is a great starting point to start saying what we feel. For example, this book says things like, Sometimes I feel cranky. Sometimes I feel like staying in the bathtub all day. I feel that way sometimes too. This gives kids a good example of what it sounds like to share what's going on on the inside. Um, in relation to feelings, we also have The Way I Feel by Janine Kane. So this book is a little better for those of you with older kids because it has a little bit more of a story with each emotion, but it follows the same premise of starting that conversation of how we feel. For example, something unfortunately very true right now, we've got this page, which says, I can't make up my mind. There is nothing I want to do. The, dra the day drags on and on. I'm feeling bored and blue. Very relevant book. So these are obviously some great ways to start that conversation. And if you don't like online shopping and you don't want to head to the store to grab a book, that's completely understandable. I will also provide you with a really great movie that you can watch with your child to start this conversation too. There are many of them out there. Um, there's a resource with a few of them that you can use, but one example is the movie Inside Out, which you can get on Netflix. Um, it's about an 11 year old and her five core emotions, fear, anger, joy, disgust, and sadness. So these, these are emotions that you can talk about when you're watching this movie with your, um, with your children. But we also have what's called tactile or kinesthetic learners. And for these learners, it can be helpful to categorize the emotions. So these early learners are better with hands-on learning that involves movement, and therefore reading a book might not be a sufficient way to start teaching emotions. But you can utilize coloration to support your ability to make emotional literacy activities at home. So for example, we have the Color Monster, this book here. It's a story about emotions by Anna Lennas. So this book will help you categorize emotions into colors. 
For example, happy is yellow, blue is sad, red is angry, green is calm. And if you want an example of what you see in the book, you have this green page that reads, this is calm, it is quiet like the trees, and is light as green leaves swaying in the wind. When reading this section, you can tell your child to put their arms in the air and sway gently back and forth like a calming tree. So those are ways that you can add in some movement into your teaching with your little ones. Um, but we can also incorporate the colors presented in the Zones of Regulation, which is a curriculum designed by Leah Coopers. We will talk about this in more depth next week, but to introduce you, there are four zones or colors involved. So we have the blue zone, which can feel like you're moving slowly, you're sick, you're sad, you're bored or tired. We have the green zone, which is optimal for learning. This is where you're feeling happy, you're calm, you're feeling focused. We have the yellow zone in which you start, um, you're starting to lose that sense of control. So you might feel a little bit silly and frustrated or worried and excited. And then finally, there's the red zone. And this is where you're going to feel mad and angry and frustrated and completely out of control. So our example earlier of the little one tossing the Legos at the wall because they couldn't un dissect them they were probably in the red zone. So the notion that, I want, I, that I'm wanting you to pick up from all of these examples is simply to start having that conversation with your little ones. So using all of these emotion words and, and trust that your child will sooner or later pick them up and be better off because of it. Moving along next week, we will piggyback off this conversation to start discussing the regulation of emotions and behaviors in our children. As always, let's work together and support each other. All comments and suggestions are welcome and encouraged. Don't forget, Miss Diane will be posting some mindful mini activities for you to do this afternoon. Have a wonderful week and we will see you next Wednesday.